Ah, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Joshua chapter 5. It's our custom here to stand, so everyone please that's able to please stand as we go into the Word. Mm. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Yee, thank you, Lord. The Word of God says in Joshua chapter 5, starting in verse 1, When all the Amorite kings west of the Jordan and all the Canaanite kings who lived along the Mediterranean coast heard how the Lord had dried up the Jordan River so the people of Israel could cross, they lost heart and were paralyzed with fear because of them. At the time, the Lord told Joshua, Make flint knives and circumcise this second generation of Israelites. Verse 3, so Joshua made flint knives and circumcised the entire male population of Israel at Gibeah Herlot. That means heel of foreskin, of the foreskin. My God. Joshua had to circumcise them because all the men who were old enough to fight in battle when they left Egypt had died in the wilderness. Those who left Egypt had all been circumcised, but none of those born after the Exodus during the years of, in the wilderness had, had, wilderness had been circumcised. Verse 6 says, The Israelites had traveled in the wilderness for 40 years until all the men who were old enough to fight in battle when they left Egypt had died. For they, for they had disobeyed the Lord, and the Lord vowed, going off for Christ and guests, he would not let them enter the land he had sworn to give us. A land flowing with milk and honey. So Joshua circumcised their sons. Thank you, Lord. Those who had grown up to take their father's places. Boy, that's revelational right there. For they had not been circumcised on the way to the promised land. After all the males had been circumcised, they rested in the camp until they were healed. <laughs> mm. Yes, Lord. Then the Lord said to Joshua, today I have rolled away the shame of your slavery in Egypt. So that, so that place has been called Gilgal to this day. While the Israelites were camped at Gilgal on the plains of Jericho, they celebrated the Passover. Very important. I'm going to teach you that. On the evening of the 14th day of the first month, verse 11 says, the very next day. Somebody said next day. Next day. They began to eat unleavened bread and roasted grain harvested from the land. Oh, my God, I can't wait to get going, God. No matter my period on that day, they first ate, my God, from the crops of the land, and it was never seen again. So from that time on, the Israelites ate from the crops of Canaan. Lord, bless this time. Lord, I thank you for the praise and worship team. Lord, I just thank you, Father God, that you gave me an opportunity, Father God, to push out. Oh, my God, that was on top of me concerning my brother down in Oklahoma City. Lord, I just thank you for this great Augustine of believers now. Now, Father God, get me all up out of the way so that you can get all up in the way. Speak to your people, Father God, in the name of Jesus. Say somebody's soul, Father God. This is business, Father God. You have given us permission to do business in your kingdom. So, Father God, move by your spirit. Save somebody's soul. Lord, I thank you for Joyce and her son. As I look at them, Father God, mother and son standing up in the presence of the Lord, worshiping, Father God, God together. Mm. Seeing the tears, Father God, roll down the men of God's face, Father God. Thank you that you encountered him today. Thank you, Lord, that his first time coming, he would never forget that he had an encounter with Christ at Going Hall for Christ Church, Lord. Lord, I thank you for the privilege, Lord, to preach to your people, teach by your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Please say amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. As I stated last Sunday, you can uh, register. I mean, you can go online and subscribe to our YouTube page. Or you can go to goingoffforchrist.org and look at the, go to the media section and look at the video from last week. Or you can get CDs and DVDs. But we started a, I started a series yesterday, I mean last Sunday, concerning the state. I was down in Oklahoma City with my uncle, Pastor Peoples, and he began to ask me and talk about the, the state, my God, of the church. And I told him that the state of the church as a whole is in a bad place overall. Not everybody, but overall. Because there's so much going on in our lives. So much stuff is dominating us. And God began to speak to me on my way back from the Oklahoma City the week before last. My God, that God is purging for the comeback. I said, God is purging for the comeback. And God showed me Joshua chapter 5, my God. And I began to inquire as I stated last week to, and talked to my spiritual father, Bishop McIntosh. He began to give me some pointers and drop some revelation in my spirit, my God. But I know that we are in a season at going off for of Christ church. My God, as I spoke to Minister Madden last Sunday, my God, after talking and teaching with our children, we was in the back fellowship and God dropped something in my spirit. I'm so glad he just brought it back to me. 
The first generation at birth going off of Christ with me is pretty much has died off. There's a whole new generation that God has sent to going off of Christ. And my, many of that is y'all, and some of, my, some of them is not her, but many of that is y'all. We're into the second generation, going on our sixth year. And I give God the glory, my God, to be a church that's almost six years old, to have what we have and have the people that we have and be in a position that we're in. We're in a good place. But God showed me, as I stated, thank you, Holy Ghost. God showed me, my God, that the first generation, as I stated, my God, has pretty much died off and shifted. Some has shipwrecked and left Christ. Some has went on to greater callings and different things in the ministry and so forth. But then God has sent me a remnant of people. As I was telling my God, the woman of God, many of you, my God, knew of me and some of you I did not know. God sent me a whole new remnant of people to begin to pastor. He didn't send me those that I grew up with. He didn't send me people that started out with me when I was at Greenwood Christian Center and so forth. Many of you I never knew. Some of you knew of me, heard of me, but I didn't actually know you personally like some of you that I do know. And so I just thank God that God always got a ram in the bush. But God is preparing me strategically, my God, as I sat in first service up under Pastor Jill this morning on that front row, and he said his job my God, is to make sure that he plant, I mean, uh, plant and let God water and give the increase in the people's lives. He said, not everybody will receive what you have. Who he stood right here on this pulpit and, and it liberated me, didn't it? Who, uh, a sister, my God, it liberated me because many people will come and some will receive today and some of you will reject what the Spirit of God has to say from the pulpit today. But he said pretty much don't get caught up in who receive and who reject. Just do what God told you to do and preach to God. This is him talking to himself, to the church, my God. So I caught that in the spirit and said that was what I needed right there. Because sometimes as a man of God, things can discourage you when you see by, the, by, the, by, by sight and not by faith. Are y'all with me so far? I'm finna father you a little bit, so just stay with me, my God. We're going to get going. Some things that you see with your natural eyes, my God, would discourage you. That's why the Bible says walk by faith and not by sight. As I teach y'all, sight is where you at, vision is where you're going. Come on, somebody. Are you with me so far? And so therefore, I thank God for the opportunity to be able to come back and finish up this. I sat down and studied over the holiday, my God, and I'm so thankful. I'm so heavy, and I'm trying to get it out, and I'm trying to get it out without rushing. That's why I'm kind of pasting myself and allowing the Holy Spirit to work through me as we get ready to move into this section, my God, of the Scripture. But it's so critical because Joshua people have ceased from wondering. They're no longer doing this in the natural Many of us, my God, in the spirit realm is doing this. We may be making progress in the natural for us going to work, doing the, num the, the mundane things of life. But in the spiritual realm, this is how we doing. We've been turning around in circles and wondering, my God, for the last 10, 15, 20 years, however long you've been saved, ask yourself, what progress have you really made for God? All of your coming, all of your giving, all of your praying, all of your studying, my God, what has come from that? Ask yourself this question, my God, what is keeping me from possessing my next? What is standing in the way of me moving farther into promise? Why do I continually want to eat mama when God has promised me milk and honey? I can't get nobody to say that. I'm going somewhere, I promise you. Who am I God? Ask yourself, why am I still eating on the past instead of eating on the future? Why am I still letting these Jericho stop me from advancing deeper into the things of God? Why is my self-image not changing? Why am I not accepting what God says I can do and shall be? What is it? What is it? Have you asked yourself, my God? Those type of questions. And if you're inspired to do great things for God, sooner or later you got to deal with yourself just like that. Amen. You got to say, God, why? And then be still enough to ask God, allow God to answer you. Okay. If you're bold enough to say why, if you're bold enough to ask God questions, then be still enough to embrace yourself. Come on, somebody, to receive what he has to say for you, to you. Are you with me so far? And so we're going to talk about this right here as we started last week. Clip, clip, clip. Some of us, we can't go no farther. Until we allow God to clip, clip, clip. God parted the Red Sea in the book of Joshua, the fourth chapter. Then he told him, when you crossed over, go back, get 12 stones. Set 12 stones down because when you come back this way so you can remember what I've done for you and when I've done it. And now, my God, as you move to chapter 5, God paused. He told Joshua, Minister Leroy, that we can go no farther. As I told y'all last week, y'all need to stay with me, church. We can go no farther. 
Guess what God is saying, Pastor Teresa? Some people in here can't go no farther. Some of us is frustrated, Minister Madeline, but we can't go no farther. Some of us is fed up, Lisa, but we can't go no farther. Some of us is angry, my God, but we can't go no farther. And so we got to ask ourselves, why is it, my God, that I can't go no farther? Why is it, my God, that I'm not seeing any progress, my God, like I once did when I first got saved? Why has the mama dried up? <laughs> why has my excitement wore off, my God? Why come I'm not hungry and thirsty no more? Not why I'm not seeing the heavens open up. Something is going on. I wonder what it is. God said, I done done some miracles in your life. But to take you deeper, I got to cut you. He didn't say fast. He said, I got to cut you. He said, I got to get something, my God, to cut you. Because this cut means, tell me that, Pastor. This cut means covenant. If you read the scripture, the first generation was circumcised. And while they was in the wilderness roaming around, they had children. But this generation couldn't go no farther into the promised land because they wasn't circumcised. Some of us, you can only go so far. Flesh will not let you go to the promised land. I'm trying to lay this foundation. Some of us to go farther. My God, we want great things. We need God to do great things in our life. And God said, I can't take you no farther until you allow me to cut you. Until you allow me to begin this circumcision. Until you allow me to start circumcising and doing internal surgery on your belief system that's hindering you, my God, and keeping you in the past. Are y'all with me so far? Oh, I know we just come off of Thanksgiving, but it's all good. It's all good. And of course, you know the title of the sermon for those who was here last week. It's called Clip, Clip, Clip. And so I got these scissors that God gave me in prayer, my God, last week. And so these scissors represent surgery. Listen to that sound. That business, you have to be clipped. Restoration of the marriage, husband and wife, you got to be clipped. To see restoration amongst father and son, we have to be clipped. To see God turning around between mother and daughter, we have to be clipped. So when you think of being clipped from context of the scripture, he clipped the foreskin. I'm watching myself because I see babies. That was a painful, painful process. But God said, I got to pause and stop right here. And I got to allow you, my God, to go through this pain so I can take you on, my God, to where I'm taking you. But I got to stop by her. And so for some of y'all, it's very painful and even frustrating at times. But if you just yield and submit to the clip and allow God to do what he's trying to do on the inside, if you allow God to purge you, if you allow God to kill some of that stuff, my God, that's interfering with you going deeper into the promised land, I promise you it's painful now, but in the end, you'll rejoice. I promise you it feel like hell right now, but in the end, you'll thank God that you went through the clip, clip, Clip. My God. And when you begin to clip, that means you got to clip people, places, and things. Some of you are holding on to people that you're supposed to clip. Some of you are going to places, my God, that you should have clipped. Some of you are hanging around people, places, and things. What are those things that's weighing you down? Who is those people that's weighing you down? What is hindering you from going deeper into the promised land? Some of us already know. What attitude is keeping you from really possessing the promised land? What business has God shown you, but he can't give it to you because too much flesh is in the way? Clip, clip, clip. This is a very untraditional type sermon. But when you think of the church, God can't take this church locally or globally no farther until he clip, clip, clip. You want everything from God, but you won't allow God to clip, clip, clip. All I'm trying to say as we move on is that there are certain things that you got to allow God to clip out of your life so you can move deeper into what God has called you to do. And God already showed me that I purge for the comeback. Anybody that don't want to be clipped will shipwreck and leave because my God is called the pain principle pleasure. People will push into the point of pain. And when the pain gets so unbearable, they retreat and go back to Egypt. That's why many people leave God. When God really start trying to clip, clip, clip. When God, my God, when it's easy to come to church and read your Bible, and God's not requiring nothing of you, but just come on. And then when he starts saying, okay, I want to take you farther. There's things I want to do for you. There's dreams and visions I'm giving you. There's things out in God and shoulders, my God. But it's going to require you give up something so you can get something. When God starts asking us to give up stuff, that's when we retreat and go back. 
Long as we don't, long as God don't put a demand on us, my God, we'll keep coming. We'll keep coming to church. We'll keep singing. We'll keep doing all that. But when God says, okay, now it's time to die. Now it's time to really forgive and let go. Now it's time to let her go. Let him go. I ain't talking about her husband and wife. Stay with me now. Now it's time to get rid of that weight that's in your life. Will you give it to me? Now it's time for you to give your Isaac back. Can you give that Isaac back that I gave to you? Can you give me the promise back? Come on, Abraham. Come give me your Isaac. God requires that we be clipped. To the Jews, circumcision was a reminder that, the, that they were in covenant with God. Circumcision, the first generation. They were never to forget that they were the servants of the living God. And my God, and that they were under an obligation to obey him in all things. Don't you know that we don't get to pick and choose when we obey? Circumcision represents covenant. As I taught y'all last week, God is a God of covenant. God does not operate outside of covenant. God will grace you when you first come, my God, come to Christ. He will work with you because you don't know no better. And my God, but as you begin to grow and you begin to spend time with God, you begin to read the word, you must understand, my God, that God is trying to bring the people back to covenant. And when you get in covenant, as I told y'all, covenant people think different, walk different, and talk different. Covenant people don't make excuses. Covenant people, my God, make a difference for God. Covenant people is who God can trust. Covenant people is who God can drop some heavy responsibility on. We want everything, but can God trust you? We in covenant with church, but we're not in covenant with the God who died for the church. When you enter into a covenant woman of God with Christ, it, it affects your internal life, which in turn affects your external life. Oh, are y'all with me so far? I'm going to teach you. I'm going to teach you. Mm. My God, circumcision was to, was to be the outward reminder, church, of an inward work of faith. Deuteronomy 10, 16 says this, therefore change your heart and stop being stubborn. In our case, a similar truth is at work, according to Colossians chapter 2, verses 1 through, I mean, 2 through 11. I mean, 2, 2 11. We have been circumcised in the heart. That means your mind. When you see heart in the New Testament, it's dealing with your mind. We need our mind to be circumcised. I taught you last week about the external circumcision that Abraham did with the first generation. Today, we're going to deal with the few minutes I have, we're going to deal with this internal circumcision. Are y'all with me so far? So circumcision was an outward reminder of an inward work, as I just stated. My God, in our case, a similar truth is at work according to Colossians 2, verse 11. We have been circumcised in our heart. When you came to Christ, you were circumcised, but not by a physical procedure. Christ performed a spiritual circumcision, the cutting away of your sinful nature. As I taught last week, I'm just kind of rehearsing for you. I just stay with me. When people come down here, Pastor Teresa, and we say, repeat this prayer after us, and you shall be saved. But what we don't tell the people, Pastor, my God, is that when you confess Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, that you are entering into a covenant. The Bible says confess, church, and then believe. Many people come down and confess, but they don't believe. And so you got thousands of people, my God, that think that they saved, and they're not. Because you can't, you, can't, you, can't, you can't do one part of the scripture. It says confess and believe. Your belief should lead you into a covenant. Your belief should lead you to a lifestyle change. Your belief should lead you to submission. Your belief will make you read your Bible. Your belief for my God in the things of God will alter your whole life. Many people come and confess the sinner's prayer, but they don't believe what they're confessing. And when you and I truly confess the sinner's prayer, you are entering into a covenant, a binding agreement between you and heaven. Oh, this is heavy, y'all. So ask yourself, do I really believe? Because we in church don't mean we believe. Don't you know you can read your Bible and speak in tongues and still not believe in the fullness of God? Don't you know that we can disqualify ourselves because of our belief system? That's why the Bible says in Proverbs, as a man thinking, so he becomes. You and I are sum total of our very thoughts. And so it's not enough just to confess Christ. Do you believe? When you come give your life to Christ, you are entering into a binding covenant. Covenant, my God, is not made to be broken. Christ came and died. He entered into a covenant first with himself, came down through 42 generations, died on a cross, my God, and bringing us back to covenant. Let me tell you, when God delivered them from, the, from Egypt and they was in the wilderness, Tony, God was trying to bring them back to covenant. Let me tell you why. To my Bible scholars, because the people that was in Egypt was used to Pharaoh. Pharaoh, they was used to his voice. When he said eat, they could eat. 
When he said go to sleep, Tanya, they slept. When he said stop, they stopped. When he said start, they start. So they was trained, Sherman, and they was conditioned by a physical furrow. They was used to physical furrow, horizontal. So when God delivered them, now you don't have nobody telling you what to do, how to do it, and when to do it. Now God said, okay, I'm going to bring you back to covenant with me. And so that's why God, my God, fed them with mama from heaven. Mama came down. Vertical go up. God is up. I can't get nobody to say nothing right there. My God. And that's why he called water to come up out of a rock in a desert. Yeah. God was trying to show himself to the people because they was dependent on a physical man. God said, you got to be dependent on me, the rock. And he let out water. Who am I to come out of a rock in a desert? Oh, that's God. I can't get nobody to say nothing right there. Oh, my God. They had never seen mama. My God, they looked up. There it was. Look up. Set your mind on things above. Oh, this is, oh my God. He was trying to bring them back to covenant. That's all I'm trying to do in this hour is bring all of us back to covenant. We got to renew our covenant. And when you're in covenant, you don't get to pick and choose. When you're in covenant, you walk different, talk different. Oh, my God, when you're in covenant, my God, you carry yourself completely different from somebody that's a church core. Oh, when you're in covenant, you don't make excuses. Oh, when you're in covenant, my God, you don't have a whole lot of compromises in your walk. Oh, my God, just because a holiday don't mean you get to stay home, my God. Oh, my God, your family might have came in from town. My God, you say, I'm going to church. My God, you can go with me, but I'll see you when I get back if you stay at home. Covenant people don't make excuses about being in the house of the Lord. Covenant people don't quit when their assignment gets tough. Covenant people don't stop, my God, when the enemy, my God, start persecuting you because of the word that's being sown in your life. The Bible says the enemy comes because of the word, Stacy, that's being sown. The devil's after the seed that's being planted right now. Oh, he's after that word that's down in the inside of you. And my God, you don't get to quit when you're in covenant. I thank God that Dr., the late Dr. Miles Moore made me really understand what kingdom mindset here. Because the things I've had to experience as a young man of God coming out that prison, my God, I don't know if I would have made it. I'm glad I fell in love with Christ instead of falling in love with church. I'm glad I learned the God who died for the church instead of learning the God of the church. Come, I said, I'm glad I fell in love with the God who died for the church instead of learning church. Church don't do it. Christ does it. Who am I talking to in the church? You're dealing with a covenant pastor. You ain't dealing with a preacher. You're dealing with a covenant pastor. Covenant make you act different, walk different, talk different. Oh, my God. When covenant people make you take a lick and keep on ticking. Who am I talking to in the church? And saying all that, God said, okay, that's good, Lawrence. Clear, clear. Clear. Let's go a little deeper. Our old natures have been judged and condemned by God, church. We need to understand that. Therefore, the believers must separate. The believers must separate themselves from the sins of the flesh. Romans chapter 6, 1 through 2 says, When then, well then, should we keep on sinning? This is Apostle Paul dealing with the church. Well then, should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace? Of course not. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? Romans 6, 11 and 12 says, so you also should consider, that's you and I, yourself to be dead to the power of sin and alive to God. Dead to the flesh and alive to the spirit is what he's saying. Come on, somebody. Do not let sin control or master the way you live. Do not give in to sinful desires. Paul is telling the church, you are dead to the old man. Even though the old man still exists, but you got to die to that man. You can't let that man manipulate you. You can't let that man drive you. That's no, that's no male or female, because in God, there's neither male nor female. So you got to understand that you and I are dead to those type of things. So when sin is mastering you, that don't mean we're not going to make mistakes. Y'all know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about habitual sin, completely, always, completely, always, completely, always making excuses about your sin. God saying we shouldn't be doing that. Habitual doing stuff. That God said we shouldn't be doing. That's the type of stuff that Paul is talking about. None of us is sinless. We all stumble. We all make mistakes. But when you and I, I and you, allow sin to dominate our master, our control, our lives, we are out of the will of God. Don't you know that sin pushes you and I out of the will of God? So, therefore, when we understand, my God, that we are out of the will of God, we got to go back and say, God, clip me. God, this thing that's pushing me or thing that's blocking me, clip it out of my life. We got to be willing to give it to God. You know, a lot of that is our attitude. Some of us got the spirit of entitlement. So, my God, we feel like we beneath this. I mean, we too, we bigger than that. I don't need to stay at the church and help clean no bad though. You know, I, 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 I don't need to greet nobody. They need to be greeting me. Pride. 
All of us got to watch that. Are you with me so far? Let's go a little deeper. The internal work. Let's look at this internal work of salvation will result in an outward work of sanctification. The Bible says you and I are being sanctified on our way to heaven. When you enter into a covenant, my God, God is doing an internal work on you. When you accept Christ, my God, God should start, my God, through his spirit, if you allow him, an internal sanctification. The Bible says, my God, the kingdom of heaven is within. As I taught y'all, Old Testament, everything was external. Jesus said the kingdom. Think about what Christ said. The kingdom kill is within. Everywhere, if you are born again, my God, believer, God is walking with you. Where are you taking him? What are you joining God with? What are you exposing God to? Ask yourself, my God, do God really want to be over here? Am I really supposed to be laying in the bed with Am I really supposed to be drinking all this, smoking all this? Why do we talk about that? Am I really supposed to be, my God, mm, concealing hatred for somebody, smiling in their face, but knowing in my heart I don't like them? Let's take it up off all the drinking. And Am I really supposed to, my God, I, God, I love you, but I'm not going to forgive Lisa. Yeah. Preaching, sir. See, God is after the internal sanctification. Covenant people don't get to make the decision to stay in habitual sin. Covenant people got a yes, a real yes, down in their soul. Covenant people will submit to the will of the Father for their life, even when we don't understand it, but because we got a yes and we understand that we don't belong to ourselves, that we belong to God, we will submit to the process even when we don't understand the process. See, that's the difference between church people and covenant people. Oh, I'm trying to lay this. So therefore, to go deeper in what God has called you to do, you're going to have to allow, and I'm going to have to allow God to clip. In order for this church to expand, I got to die some more. I got to allow God to clip some more. You love, you love to say that, didn't you? You know what I'm saying? I got to allow God to clip. I got to die. I'm putting myself right there with y'all. I told y'all, as y'all go through, I'll go through. Yeah. When y'all happy, I'm happy. When y'all hurt, I hurt. That's the heart of a real shepherd. The Bible says when God called for Samuel, my God, David, my God, when David went to go check on his brothers, the Bible says that David left the sheep with another shepherd. You just don't leave your people with anybody. Yeah. Oh, my God. See, y'all not used to it. Y'all used to be a priest too, but not a pastor. Oh, preaching to somebody is different from pastoring. And so many people in the body of Christ, they want to be preached to, but they don't want to be pastoring. People run from real pastoring. Because real pastoring requires that you put your hands on it. Real pastors say, okay, Lisa, then, mm, come on. Real pastor. When I preach to you, drop your ties, jump and shout, run around. Ooh, girl, we had to move a guy. Go on, live how you want to live. I'll see you next Sunday. That's preaching. And that's what the people want in the day. And I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. This is a different type of flow, but it's a good flow. It's truth. And it's Bible. Ain't no flesh, all God. So ask yourself, are you in covenant or are you on contract with God? Where you at this afternoon? You in church, but are you in covenant? Is something mastering you other than the spirit of the living God? It has to be clipped. Let's go a little deeper. If you are saved, then you are supposed to live like you are saved, according to the book of Peter. Come on. Anything that is displeasing to the Lord needs to be clipped from your life. It needs to be cut off and put away. This is how zombies walk. They appear to be alive, but they dead. This is how we look. Dragging stuff that God says, clip it. Clip it so you can walk. 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 And quit. Clip it so you can walk. Clip it so you can walk. Clip it. Clip it. I ain't trying to get you happy. I'm trying to drop some substance in your life. So you can go out and affect the world instead of letting the world affect you. Mm-hmm. There are some in this room today who have failed to live out the covenant they made with the Lord when he first served you. Some of us has deviated. One of my favorite scriptures, Matthew 5 and 6, blessed is the man who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Whenever you and I lose your hunger, you start backsliding. Whenever you and I lose your hunger for the things of God. Don't you know, oh my God, my God, things of, the, of God is not tasteful to a lot of Christians. Reading the Bible is not tasteful. Coming to fellowship is not tasteful mm -hmm. to Christians. Mm -hmm. 
Jesus said, blessed mother is those who hunger and thirst. Dr. Miles taught us that that hunger is to continue hunger. It's never quenched. That thirst is never satisfied. It, it, it never, you can eat 50 Big Macs and you still want 50 more. You can drink the Red Sea and you're still thirsty. It's never satisfied. So why am I saying that? Because I thank God, Joyce, that when he saved me all them years ago, Ken Ken, I ain't never stopped hungering after God. People ask me, how'd you? What happened? I ain't never lost my hunger. How's you still going? I ain't never lost my hunger. When people lie on me, talk about me, misunderstand me, preach too hard, preach too real, whatever, I ain't never lost my hunger. I ain't never lost my focus, brother Leroy. I ain't never. Blessed is the man. I'm trying to drop something. Blessed is the man or woman who hungers. Hungering will keep your conviction high. When you hunger for God, you won't drop past the five. When you hungry for God, my God, anything don't work. Anybody won't work. When you hungry for God, you just won't lay up with anything. Oh, you just won't join yourself to anything. My God. Especially when you know he ain't doing that. She ain't doing it. When she not she, when he or she are not speaking to your purpose. When you're hungry for God, you be like, you, you don't get it. You, 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 you don't do it no more. Hunger. So ask yourself, why am I saying that? Are you hungry this afternoon? Y'all know we had some high times in this church. But I don't want to preach high times. I want to preach principles. Ask yourself, where is your hunger this afternoon? Are you still tenacious? Are you still thirsty for the things of God? Do, do, do you wake up thinking about this? Do you grab this before you grab Facebook? Do this matter in your life? Because the Bible says heaven and earth going to pass away. And the only thing going to be left, mother, is the word of God. How important is this in your life, Christians? This keeps you and I in covenant. When you and I lay this down, we are doomed for destruction. Many people are trying to serve God. How can you and I function in God's kingdom? We don't know how the kingdom operate. The Bible teaches you and I how to do business in this kingdom. The Bible is about a king, church, and his kingdom. We are subjects in God's kingdom. In order to properly manage God's resources, we got to know how to do it. And God gives us instructions to his world how to manage his resources. Many of us is mismanaging. We're not stewarding the resources. God has filled all of us with gifts and talents. Are you using them to advance God's kingdom? George, this is kingdom. Lord, have mercy. You need to come and renew your covenant. You need to get back into fellowship with the Father and serve him as you should. Put number two on the screen for me, daughter. After God circumcised him, he took him to step number two. There's a confirmation. Let's go. Let's get it done. Their obedience to the Lord's command for them was to be circumcised. It was a supreme act of spiritual preparation. When God is clipping on you, he's cutting on you for preparation for something greater. When God begins strategically allow trials to come into your life, it's God trying to purge you and burn some up out of your life because that's going to hinder where you're going. When God allow pressure, y'all stay with me, church. When God still allowing pressure, life can be going real good. And all of a sudden, this all kind of stuff break out in your life. And we panic. Bishop taught me never panic because the water's trouble. Sometimes God will trouble the waters because he's trying to get your attention. God also will allow trouble to hit your life, my God, because God is trying to get up out of you something that's going to hinder you from moving deeper into your purpose. See, what we do, because we, don't un we mismanage the resources and the will of God. Ooh, watch that resources and the will of God. Instead of something that's supposed to bless us, yeah. it ended up cursing us. Yeah. Something that's supposed to move us deeper into possessing the freedom and the promised land, we stay on the other side of the Jordan. We should have been on the other side of the promised land because we mismanage. We see troubles and trials as some from the devil. But the Bible says in every good and perfect gift come from above. Why can we don't see trials as a good and perfect gift? Gift. Oh, oh, why come we don't see? The Bible says every good uh, sparkle and perfect gift come from above. Why come we as a people of God who are supposed to be in covenant don't see trials as a perfect gift? When the Bible says God likens our faith, my God, he, he purifies our faith through fire. The hotter the fire, the purer the, pure the faith. So God will use trials to purify you and I. But we don't see trials as a blessing. Oh, my God, if you read your Bible, Psalms 119, 71 said it was good for me that I was afflicted. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. Don't you know affliction has a way of wearing you back into God's will. Affliction has a way of putting you back on track. Affliction has a way of benefiting you when you submit to it, church. But covenant people understand that. Church people run from affliction. Ooh, Lord, have mercy. Mm, mm, mm. 
They had to be willing to trust the Lord to protect them until they were healed. They was cut, and now they need to heal. Don't you know that, my God, many of us make the mistake that when we're bleeding, we still try to go out and accomplish things, and we're not healed? One of the worst things you can do is when you're going through a separation is go try to do marital counseling. You ain't healed. One of the worst things you could do when you separate from a long time relationship with a man or a woman, my God, husband or wife, it don't matter, even if it's just boyfriend, the first thing you do is, is try to date on a rebound. You're not healed. Many of us got wounds that God never intended for us to have. When we got cut, my God, when something happened, we should have stayed in camp until it healed. Jesus told them, don't move, my God, stay right here until you heal. Oh, you can't move forward, my God. You can't possess the land. Huh? You can't move deep in purpose until you get healed. You got to stop right here, my God. You got to stay right here. And one of the most difficult things for the people of God is to wait on God. One of the difficult things for the people of God is to wait on God. And see, my God, he cut them and I said, be still. You're not ready to try to fight no demons. You're not ready to move deeper. You got to heal. Oh, many of us are not healed, but we're trying to possess everything. God said, I can't do it because you can't handle it, my God. You ain't ready. You ain't healed enough. You're still wounded. Your conscience is wounded. Your self-esteem is wounded. Sit still and wait. Being still is the enemy to Christians. We feel like if we ain't moving, we ain't productive. We feel like if we ain't doing something, my God, we just waste, waste the time. That's not true. You get on the battlefield, you do good battle, then you come off the battlefield, go into the barracks, sit down, get healed, get recharged, and go right back to battle. Mm, mm, mm. So they had to heal. Watch this. When God cuts you, you must heal. Watch this. That means heal from your past. God is cutting away Egypt out of the, the children of Israel. He's cutting it away. God is trying to cut away your past. If you don't allow God to heal your past, you'll go back to your past. If you don't allow God to heal your past, you will go back to your past. Oh, you'll be like a dog returning back to his vomit. Oh, my God, because God cut you and you got a band-aid, my God, but you didn't get healed, my God. Oh, my God, so no, you thought you was ready. You've been cleaning this over for 30 days. You think you can go back, my God. No, my God, you got to get healed and you got to be still. Because if you don't heal, you're going back. I thank God that I had time to spend in that prison to heal. So I never went back 23 years later. Never returned back to Egypt. Because I let God get all of me, and he still got all of me. The same tenacity I had when I was locked up, I got that. I haven't it even increased. Don't you know when God do stuff for you, you got to increase your love for him? Many of us, when God bless us and get us out, when he take the squeeze off, you go back to being... When God squeeze you and he take the pressure off, this should increase your love for him. It should increase your desire for him. Many people make the mistake of when God cuts you and when God bless you, you give God just a little. When God do it for you, my creator, give him the glory. When God did done a miracle, increase your tenacity. When God had made a way out of no way, fall more and more in love with him. Oh, my God, I'm trying to help the church. So when God cuts you, you must heal. You mean you got to heal from your past. Ask yourself, am I healed from my past? Am I really healed from my past? My past keeping me from possession, the promised land. I done came up on the other side of the Jordan. I'm in Canaan, but as I talked to you last week, but it's Canaan in me. I'm standing in freedom. Jordan, that's, that's, the other side of the Jordan represents bondage and captivity, trees. I'm on the other side of the Jordan, Minister Tony. I'm standing in freedom. I'm on the land of free. I'm in the land of freedom. But how free am I? We living in America where we are physically free, but how free are you? God said, my God, in order for you to, you didn't came up on the other side. You standing in Canaan, promise, Canaan, promise, freedom. You know what I'm saying? But there's a whole nother, a whole nother uh, 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 level out there for you to go to. But you right here and you can't go no farther because what's in you is going to keep you from going deeper into the purpose. What's in you going to keep you from going deeper and farther into that what God has called you to do? God said, I bought you out. I'm going to keep you right here. I'm going to cut you, stay right here and heal. Because just on the other side, in freedom, there's a Jericho. If you don't enter into covenant, my God, you're going to get out there on your own. And that Jericho that you should defeat is going to defeat you instead of you defeat it. God is trying to teach them strategic moves. I cut you. I bought you back to covenant. Now sit still and wait. Get healthy, get whole, get some revelation, get some rest, get some strategic plans. 
spend some time in prayer, learn some spiritual disciplines, learn how to trust and wait on God. Cursed is the man who leans on the arm of flesh. God is trying to teach the people, my God, I didn't brought you out of Pharaoh in Egypt. Now let me take you and trust and help you conquer your giants. Ah, oh, thank you, Lord. Let's go a little deeper. I love the flow. While they waited, they were vulnerable to attack. See, this is very important because even though they are on the other side of the Jordan, they're in Canaan, but there's some Canaanites. But you know that God delivered them, but he left some ants, some Canaanites and Perizzites and Bishop call them ites. There's some ites still left in your life. There's some ites, Canaanites and Perizzites and wherever them ites, ites, ites. Don't you know that God didn't kill all the giants? God would leave enemies in the land to train you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, he could have killed them all, but he left some because enemies would train you. When you wait on God and when you're healthy, your self-image and self-esteem is healthy. My God, them any of you God would use to train you. Then you step over there in the room and say, all things are working together for the good to those who love God. Oh, my God, this enemy that's coming against me is working for my good. That situation that I'm dealing with is working for my good. That problem that, my God, the people talking about me, lying on me, all that stuff is working for my good. God is using your Canaanites, my God, to develop you and mold you. Oh, my God, but why did God leave the Canaanites in the land? I'm glad you asked. Why did God leave, my God, the Canaanites in the land of freedom? As the Spirit of God said, God will leave enemies in the land to train you. God had to confirm his will for their life. If God hadn't left the Canaanites in the land, they didn't think they'd done it. God said, no, 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 I'm going to heal you, I'm going to cut you, I'm going to heal you. But I'm going to leave these enemies out there. You're going to need me to help you defeat them. Because if you don't, my God, if I don't, if I let you do them, then you're going to, you're going to get the glory instead of God get the glory. So, my God, their faith was the secret to their success. Now I'm in the promised land. I'm cut. I'm back in covenant, though. Circumcision represents covenant. I'm back in covenant. I need to heal. And while I'm healing, I'm learning the art of waiting. But God got them waiting in Canaan. With enemies all around them. Yeah. Boy, y'all got to read the Bible. Yeah. Yeah. You mean tell me God gonna cut me and I'm wounded? Yeah. Yeah. But everywhere I turn, Tony, ain't nothing but enemies. <laughs> God, how you say you love me and you got I'm cut, I'm vulnerable, I'm wounded. Oh, after that, and I got all these enemies around me, and you want me to sit here and wait? Oh, I, I got a weapon, but I can't use it because I'm bleeding. I'm in real pain right now. Oh, God, how am I going to do this, God? Faith is the key to success. See, God got to know how to... Oh, God know how to mold you and shape you, my God. Oh, I'm in the midst of these enemies. You tell me I got to wait? Because guess what? This next move in your life is going to take real faith, not church faith. I can't get nobody to say, oh, it's going to take real God faith to move deeper. Oh, my God. I said it's going to take real God faith, my God, to move deeper into purpose. So I'm in the midst of all these Canaanites. I'm bleeding. I'm wounded. And you telling me to wait? Oh, God. God is building your faith while you wait. God is also teaching them, thank you, Holy Ghost, that it's not by your might nor by your power, but it's by my spirit, saith the Lord. Mm. Oh, my God. But see, God had to clip them. Don't you know sometimes God got to allow you to be wounded for you to listen? God said, I, I got to cut them, bring them back to covenant, but while I'm cutting them, I'm wounding them. Sometimes you got to be wounded. That's the same way you're going to be still. God had to put me in a six by nine to slow me down because I was going too hard on the street. But I thank God that I went there. Oh, sometimes you got to be cut in order for God to get your attention. God got to wound you. Some of us is wounded right now. We don't know. Even though I did this, it's okay to be like this when you're moving towards purpose. It's okay to drag some Canaanites. It's okay to drag some Perizzites. It's okay, my God, as long as you're moving towards purpose. But see, we start questioning God when he started turning up the heat. I'm in covenant. I'm bleeding. I'm helpless. And I got enemies all around me. Outlook determines outcome. And so while I'm cutting, while I'm cut, bleeding, and waiting, God is building my faith. In order to get victory, there's three things that you and I must do. Let's write these down. Oh, my God. Sometimes God got to cut you to help you. 
Woo. He got to clip people out your life to help you. Yeah. Oh, my God. I know you love him, but he got to go. Oh, I know you love her, but she, oh, let me be careful. I know you love the casinos, but they got to go. I know you love Housewives of Atlanta, but they got to go. Oh, I know you love QVC, but they got to go. Oh, I can't get nobody to say nothing. Clip, clip, clip. Say that with me. Clip, clip, clip. In order to move into victory, write down for prayer. Let me move you forward. Thank y'all for allowing me to take my time and try to teach this. It's not always easy when you're trying to birth a real meaty word. It's easy to jump and shout and run and scream. It don't take nothing to do that. That's flesh. But can you sit here and allow the Spirit of God to draw up out of you living water that's going to feed the people? Peace five minutes and let the people go. But can you allow God to draw that living water up out of you to feed God's people? That's not always easy. It takes God to do that. And so thank you for being a listening people. So you got to prepare in the story to bring it back to context. We got to understand that all of our enemies we face are already defeated. Write that down. Prepare. That means that you got to be mentally prepared by understanding that all of your enemies is already defeated. Why? Because of Calvary over 3,000 years ago. Every foe, every enemy is already defeated. What you and I have to do is get still and get God's strategic plan on how to defeat the enemies in our life. Let me say that again. Every enemy is already defeated, Minister Tony, but we have to get still and get God's pulse and get God's strategic plan on how to kill this giant, how to defeat this enemy. We need God's strategy. Flesh ain't going to kill no enemy, y'all. Flesh birth flesh, spirit birth spirit. So we got to find God's spiritual pulse on how to defeat these enemies. But you got to tell yourself, Mr. Oliver, I'm already victorious, not because of what I do, but because of what he did. That's how you prepare for victory. The first thing, you got to know that you're already victorious. I don't care if you are struggling with a hang-up and habit. You're victorious. The Bible says call those things to be not as though they are. You got to speak this stuff into existence. You got to see it, my God, by faith. My God, sight would discourage you, but faith will push you. Come on, somebody. You're already victorious. See yourself on the other side of the Jordan. See yourself delivered and set free. See your marriage restored. See your children back home in their right mind, in their right place, my God. Oh, see your financial giants of the Canaanites with financial giants. See that stuff defeated in your life. You got to remind yourself as Christians that you're already victorious. Because of what Christ did for you over 2,000 years ago. Good, solid word. So prepare. Preparation. As me and Champ always say, it's never time wasted. Don't you know that you got to prepare to be victorious before you ever get into a battle? That's why some of the mundane shoveling sheep dung, it don't seem like it matter. But David was over there shoveling sheep dung, preparing to be victory, to be victorious as a king. And also he killed Goliath, shoveling sheep dung. David saw himself. He already seen Goliath defeated before he ever went. Who is this circumcised that's disrespecting the children of Israel? Who is this defying the armies of the Lord? David said, I got a 17-year-old kid moving through the crowd with a mindset to already kill a giant. He was already victorious before he ever faced the giant. Many of you are losing because, mm, Many of you are not killing your giants because you see yourself defeated. You got to see yourself victorious before you ever start fighting giants. And every giant, my God, that you're dealing with, every enemy, every Canaanite that's in your life, you got to tell yourself as of today, I am victorious. God is waiting for you to shift your mind so he can move that giant out of your life. A lot of us are staying in the, out of the God's will because we are not letting God do what he needs to do in our life. You got to see yourself as victorious. That means you got to prepare. But you prepare way before you fight a battle. That's why flipping the pages and praying and showing up and being found faithful, the Bible says God shows himself faithful to those who are faithful. Don't you know you prepare to win battles way before you fight battles? Yeah. Yeah. Many of us, we don't stop preparing until we get in a war. Yeah. Yeah. You're not already lost, buddy. Yeah. 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 Moose you catch that? Many of us don't prepare for war until we get in a war. You got to be preparing for war way before you get in a war. It's elementary, but it's hard for us to apply it. Because we don't like to fight until we got to fight. Yeah. Other than that, we want to get caught up in all of the things of the world. Yeah. Be careful. Yeah. I know it's the holidays, but be careful getting caught up in all of the stuff that's going on with these holidays. Yeah. And the enemy is lurking. Yeah. He's looking. Yeah. Yeah. Looking for someone, as the Bible said, to devour. Yeah. Number two, you got to remember. We're talking about victory. 
preparing for victory. You got to remember, by partaking of the Passover, this assured them of two things, just as the Red Sea crossing will be followed by the destruction of the Egyptian. Likewise, the crossing of the Jordan will be followed by the defeat of the Canaanites. What am I saying? Remember the past. Remembering the past became an excellent preparation of faith for the test in the future. So remembering is a good, is good preparation, preparation for test in the future. Can you remember what God done for you? Can you remember how God turned it around for you? Can you remember when he showed up for you? Can you remember? Don't you know that everything that God does, he does it because he wants the glory? Don't you know that sometimes God will let you get in some cold-blooded situations that he allowed you to get in because he's going to get the glory out of it. Oh, everything you're going through ain't the devil. <laughs> Some of us are, oh, my God, designed by God, my God. Oh, Tiffany, when I, oh, my God, Tiffany, let's speak to your situation, woman of God. Don't you know, don't you know, you got to remember what God done for you. That's why he told them when they crossed over, get these 12 stones. Bring them on over to Canaan because you're coming back this way. My God, don't you know that you got to remember, my God, it's okay to look back at your past and remember how God did it for you. Come on, you got to remember, I preached years ago, blessed is in remembrance. Some of us has forgotten what God has brought you out of, and that's why you don't hunger no more, and that's why you ain't thirsty no more, and that's why you become lukewarm, my God, because you forgot the hell that you was once here. Before. Don't get me started before God came into your life. You didn't forget, my God, what God has done for you. You didn't forget how God has showed up for you. You forgot, my God, when your wife walked off and left you. You didn't forget when your kids didn't want to talk to you, and God is just switching it now. You didn't forget. You forgot when you were strung out on drugs and all that stuff. And now you didn't forget. You forgot when he made Gap be still in that car wreck. You forgot when they had that shootout and you didn't get shot. You didn't forget. If you, my God, somebody stand up and give God some glory. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Hey, my God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some of y'all have forgotten what God has done for you. Oh, every now and then you got to look back and remember. Oh, you got to say, my God, in God I live and in God I move. Didn't nobody do it for me but Jesus. Some of you didn't forget, as I keep redundantly saying, have you forgotten what Christ has done for you? Have you forgotten that God has parted the Red Sea? Cancel, be still. They fired you, and a week later they called you back. You got to remember. You got to remember. Go ahead and sit down. I'm almost through. I had to bring myself down because I didn't want to start. Mm. Future. Write down future. 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 We're talking about preparing for victory. Eating from Canaan, y'all, spoke to the new beginning of their new life. Eden and Canaan spoke of a new beginning and a new life. The Bible says in verse 11 and 12, listen, I'm about to. The very next day, it's after they took the Passover. The very next day they began to eat unleavened bread and roasted grain, harvested from the land. Verse 12 says, no mama appeared, no manna appeared on the day they first ate from the crops of the land. And it was never seen again. So from that time on, the Israelites ate from the land of Canaan. Now that you have crossed over and you're in freedom, you're on the other side of the Jordan, God said, I'm no longer going to feed you with mama. Manning. Manning, mama represents captivity food. Manna represents flesh. Manna represents low self-esteem, drug addiction. Sexual sin, all that stuff, alcoholism, all of those type of stuff that God has brought you in out of, physical abuse, verbal abuse. God saying you are in freedom now, going off of Christ. I'm about to. Why are you still craving captivity food? You in the land of the living, the free, that's milk and honey, that's better food. The Bible says when they crossed over into the Jordan, they stopped eating from the past. Why do you keep eating on the past? Why do you keep going back to food? Because it still tastes good to the flesh. But when you are operating and developing and growing in the spirit, fleshly food don't taste good no more. That form of life don't work no more. 
Ain't no satisfaction, my God, in going back to the clubs and all of those stuff that God ain't, 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 see, it ain't, it ain't tasteful no more. The Bible says, Mama stopped and they started eating from the land. Freedom. Won't you eat the food that God has for you in freedom, y'all? Guess what that food is? Do anybody know? The word. The word. It's good. Reading the Bible is good. Praying is good. Having meetings is good. Fellowshipping is good. Seeing people set free and delivered is good. Seeing people give their life to Christ is good. Seeing people come to Christ is good. Seeing your daughter get healed from cancer at this church is good. I can't get nobody to say nothing like that. It's good on this side. And so why do you and I keep craving manna? Even though it was the miracle food, but God said it's going to cease. Now for to feed you from freedom. Yeah, I eat good on this side now. Oh, my God, I'm trying. I'm for the close. I said I eat good on this side now. Shade, your pastor eat real good from the land of freedom. Ken, Ken, I eat good from the land of freedom. Ain't nothing the world got to offer me that's satisfying. I done been there, done that, seen that, taste that, and did it. I'm done with it. I'm trying to help you, church. I'm about to, I'm finna close it. I'm finna close it. See, some of you keep trying to eat from food that, that, that don't taste good. Every time you bite the apple, you spit it out. Every time you try to go back and give him or her another chance, it don't work. <laughs> every time you go back to the club, you, don't, you ain't satisfied. Or every time you try to go back and this don't work, quit making your hand fit somewhere it don't fit no more. Why you keep trying to eat old bread? Why you trying to eat old food? <laughs> Won't you eat some of this land, this, this food that's come, my God, that's in freedom. Some of this healthy self-esteem, healthy self-image, my God. Peace in the midst of a storm, my God. Freedom from all type of hangups and habits. Freedom from all type of addictions and so forth. And as I taught y'all, addiction is not just drugs and alcohol. What has you bound? What needs to be clipped in your life, my God? What is God after right now that he wants you to clip, clip, clip as we get ready for this altar? What is it, my God, that's going to hinder you from eating on the good land? What is going to hinder you from eating in freedom? What is going to hinder you from eating in freedom? Some of our appetites need to change. We need to clip the appetite. The appetite is still for the flesh. It's still for the flesh. As I close. Thank you. Boy, this is a tough word. Is any of y'all benefiting? Come on, talk to me. Is anybody benefiting? As I said, eating from Canaan, the promise, it spoke of new beginnings and a new life. God is more than able to sustain you through anything he leads you to. God is able to sustain you, church, anything that he leads you to. He led the children of Israel across the Jordan, and now he said, I'm going to sustain you. Man, I'm going to cease. I'm going to give you some of this, this land of milk and honey. I'm going to give you some of this new food that should be tasteful to believers that's in covenant. Don't you know whatever God calls for, he provides for a church? And then it goes on to say, my God, mm. Jeremiah 32, 27 says, I am the Lord, the God of all mankind. God asked the question, is anything too hard for me? He is able to do all that you need him to do. But there's one requirement, is that you trust God. Some of us struggle this afternoon with a real trust in God. We struggle with faith. Faith has everything to do with trust. If you have unhealthy faith, you're going to have unhealthy trust. If you don't have healthy trust, you're going to have unhealthy faith. Are y'all listening to me, church? Some of us in this hour, to move deeper into that, what God has called us to do. Some of us return back to our vomit. Some of us has got stuff back in our life and let Canaanites back into our life. And God said, daughter, son, clip it. I can't take you no farther. Come here, Pastor Champ. I can't take you no farther. The church is going off of Christ, and prophetically speaking, we have crossed over the Jordan. We are in freedom. But God said, in order to go farther, in order to go farther, I'm going to have to clip some things. You're going to have to let some things go. You're going to have to let some people go. You're going to have to make some decisions that's going to make you uncomfortable. you got to move up out of being comfortable. You know why a lot of people don't stick and stay? Because it's uncomfortable sitting up under this type of word. They don't want to be clipped, and I'm learning to be okay. I said, I'm learning to be okay. It's hard to come sit up under this type of teaching here because see, it don't deal with the flesh. It deals with the spirit. Ooh, 
Woo. That's why they don't commit and stay, and that's okay. One plant, one water, but it's God that gives the increase. Oh, my God, many of them left. The Bible says, my God, many of them turned away, and Jesus looked at Peter and said, will you leave too? They said, this is too hard for me, and they left him. And God looked at Peter and said, will you leave me too? Peter said, to whom shall I go? You got the words of eternal life. That's been your pastor's conviction from day one. Since April the 30th of 1995, Leroy, to whom shall I go? You have the words of eternal life. We didn't see many of them leave. But Juju from Greenwood Christian Center is still hungry, still thirsty, still killing giants, still standing for God. Refuse to back up and retreat. God didn't give up on me and I won't give up on him. I said, I, God didn't give up on me and I won't give up on him. Have you gave up on God? Have you gave up on God? Have you gave up on God? Come on, stand on your feet. Come on, stand on your feet. Come on, stand on your feet. I refuse to retreat. God didn't cut me. I got all these enemies around me. And you telling me to stand still. You still you, these enemies is mocking me and laughing at me. Yeah, stand still. People talking about you, stand still. Being misunderstood, stand still. Everybody don't understand your testimony, stand still. Everybody can't handle where you're going, stand still. Everybody don't understand, my God, when you testify the way you testify, stand still. Everybody don't understand. Everybody ain't going to understand when you went to the altar, the blessing is in remembrance, and I know why you went down there. Oh, my God, everybody ain't going to understand. Oh, my God, but you got to stand still uh, and let them laugh at you, Alva. Let them talk about you, Felicia. Oh, let them misunderstand you. Oh, Oh, my God, my God. But stand still and watch God do it. But the first thing you and I got to do, my God, you got to allow God to bring you back to covenant. Because many of us is in church, but we're not in covenant.